Welcome, what is up? Gym room, gym room is burning. Welcome back to Foster the Meeple, a channel all about board games and board gamey things. I am Kyle, welcome back to another episode of King's Court. This week, we are gonna go on a little bit of an offshoot of a video you saw maybe about a week, two weeks ago, where I joined Jeff and Jamie to talk about our top five brain burner games. And Jamie brought up something that was really interesting to me when she brought up Calico. And I was like, that is a really good pick. And I love that pick because it was a brain burner that's very easy to learn. My five-year-old plays Calico with me. So I was like, that is a really crunchy game that's super easy. So I wanted to do something similar to that, but like my brain burners had like Barrage, Paladins of the West Kingdom. Those games are really hard to learn. And so like they just inherently have crunch to them. So I wanted to go over the top five games that are easy to learn, but hard to master or games that are easy, really easy rule set. And the strategy is really where it gets its weight. Let's get started. These are in no particular order, by the way, I'm just going to kind of grab them off the top and whatever I grab, we're going to discuss. So first game, we have a two player game by Matthias Kramer and Capstone Games called Watergate. In Watergate, some person plays President Nixon, historically good guy, and the other person plays the newspaper, the Washington Post. And this game is like just a tug of war, and the rules are so easy. You're just playing cards, and you're either playing a card for uh, its value, or you're playing the event associated with it. And if you play it for the event, the card goes away forever. You're never getting it back. And what Nixon is trying to do is he's trying to get these five red tokens to his side. And what the paper is trying to do is you're trying to get these he's trying to get these like green blue yellow tokens to connect on the board back to Nixon but it's really easy to learn once you have it all. I could probably teach this game in like five minutes because it's literally just read the card and just do what it says I struggled with this one because I was between this and Airland and Sea and I just think two player dueling games kind of do this well the tug of war you're the crunch between the players because you're like you're usually when you're playing a two player game you're usually playing the person and not the game and I think that's really where this comes into that's this first game Watergate I really like this game not only for the strategic I love the theme and you never really see stuff like that I guess some GMT games but just this one does it really well in a really interesting way game two is ooh, this is a game that I actually played with Jeff and Jamie Irish Gage also by Capstone Games one of my favorite publishers Ohio Reppin Irish Gage is a train game it's what's called a cube rail game what it does is it takes like 18xx style mechanics and really for lack of a better word dumbs it down to one simple mechanic and that's the game you're playing so in irish gauge what you're doing is you're bidding on stocks for five different train companies and then if you own that train company you're trying to connect them to different cities and then when you call for dividends your trains will get paid out and it's just like who makes the most money and you want to know how easy this game is to learn this is the rules one page and the first page is set up so irish gauge is very easy to learn it's very quick to play too it's 45 minutes and actually i think this is what kind of like i know i mentioned jamie with calico i think this kind of what got the gears in motion in my brain for this because like me and Jeff were talking after playing this game and like how much we just appreciate games with with easy rule sets but like still have that crunch to them like you can play games with easy rule set Ticket to Ride is a great game and it has very easy rules but it doesn't necessarily have like the most strategic depth to it and so like when we were playing Irish Gage I think that's really became the theme of the week when they were here is like let's play games that were easy to teach but still had that strategy and Irish Gage really has it and it speaks volumes to the game design when you can do do something this simple and still make a really fun game and it still has so much variability and all that so irish gauge is a cube rail game my, probably my full i was gonna say it was my favorite cube rail game but iberian gauge is also good but it's a little bit heavier but irish gauge i think if you want to if you want to dip your toe into train games start with irish gauge uh that's just my suggestion if you don't like this you would not like any other train games next up on the list is oh i'm excited about this one this was a gift from jeff for my birthday thanks homie this is tigris and euphrates by the Dr. Reiner Knizia. I wanted to talk about this, Cordell Stewart, Yellow and Yangtze. I said Cordell Stewart. He was a football player in the 90s who played wide receiver and quarterback, and his nickname was Slash. So when I said Cordell Stewart, I was like, Slash? Tigers and Euphrates, Slash? Yellow and Yangtze? Yellow and Yangtze is like the same game as Tigers and Euphrates, except it uses hexes instead of squares, and a game I used, I previously owned, but I wanted the original. Reiner Knizia is like really known for this style of design, where he makes the rules so easy, and then the game is so hard to be good at. Tigers and Euphrates is like his best. This is the 
only game in the top 100 and then it fell out of the top 100 and everybody's like, oh my God, how does Ryan Kennedy not have a game in the top 100 on BGG? It's because the BGG rankings aren't that important, people. But Tigers and Euphrates is like a really old game and still has so much strategic depth and it still holds up today. It's all about board positioning. You have like four actions you can do in this game and you do two of them on your turn and they're very easy. It's You can place tiles, you can place a leader, you can discard your tiles, get new ones. It's all about just setting yourself up on different spots on the map and then starting conflicts because like when you have four sets of squares over here and a couple sets of squares over here and then they merge together to create one big region then they go into conflict and it's whoever has the most leaders or something and it's kind of hard to explain how the conflicts work I guess that's probably the hardest part about the game and then whoever wins that conflict is going to get points in the color that caused it so if black was the tile that merged the two regions together whoever won the conflict would get a black point the real interesting thing about this game and its scoring something that Reiner Kennedy is also known for is there are four colors that you score in black red yellow and blue your points are whatever you have the least of so it doesn't matter if you have 10 reds 10 yellows and 10 blues if you have one black because then you have one point becomes this whole thing of like people stop ignoring you when you start hitting reds they don't care so it's all about you balancing yourself saying like I got I think I have enough reds now like I really need to get my blacks up I need to get my blues up and so it really becomes not only just like positioning and playing the game but theme of this little video I guess is like just playing the other players and knowing what they have and what they want and knowing when to get into battles and stuff so the rules for this game and yellow and Yankee are actually very very simple the actions are so easy but there's so much depth I mean like people I respect um, in the board game sphere like love this game and have been playing it for like 20 years now and still get that much out of it that's a great great game I can't say I'm like the the biggest Reiner Kinesia fan I think he's a volume scorer he just puts out a lot of stuff and then like one hits and then it's like genius level stuff but Tigers and Euphrates Yellow and Yangtze some of the other games are just like so good at doing what this video is talking about of having very easy rules and a ton of strategy in them all right game four this is going to be a hot topic I kind of wanted to mention this at the beginning of the video when I say the rules are easy to learn that's relative so don't be coming in the comments like comic book guy from the Simpsons uh, actually those are that's like 20 pages no like just be cool all right these rules may be tougher than like King of Tokyo I get it but like compared to like other games like barrage and stuff like that these rules are not that hard so just take it with a grain of salt I guess so this game is going to be onk uh by Eric Lang and come on games onk has a lot of stuff I have I have all of it I backed most of it this was actually this experience was actually sent to me by Asmodee Canada, so thank you to them for completing my collection of Ankh. But Ankh looks intimidating because of all this stuff, and it's a bear to put out on the table because there's so much, you're just sorting out your monsters, you're sorting out your gods. There's a lot to Ankh, but the rules are very similar to Tigers and Euphrates, whereas there are four different actions you're going to do, and here are those actions. I can probably rally them off real quick. Move, and when you move, you can move everybody up to three spaces. There's no restrictions. You don't have to worry about water. You don't have to worry about other people. You don't have to worry about what you're crossing over as long as you end in an empty space move everyone you can get followers which is just money you just get money you can unlock a onk power which is just on your player board you just spend the money get a power moves in this are like so easy like i almost feel like i could just set this game up and say like let's play and then like we'll just go down the line and do these actions but when i do teach this game one thing i say to people is like i'm going to explain these rules and you won't get it until you get it it's one of those things where you don't really fully understand why this stuff matters until about halfway through and even though you know you like understand what i'm saying you i'm not like speaking gibberish at the table you know what i'm saying you just don't understand like why it makes sense or why it would matter until you get through about 60 percent of the game you're like ah okay this is insane there's so much you have to consider anka is kind of all about board positioning it can be kind of very chess like even with three or four players five players it's all about positioning on the map you're trying to get yourself next to monuments and there are three different monuments and you're trying to get next to certain ones for your onk powers you're trying to get next to certain ones for scoring you're trying to get into different regions because the way combat works is there's everything's divided into regions and then they trigger from one to five or one to six however many regions there are so it's like do i want to be in this battle first but then you have these cards in your hand and when you're in battles you have to play these cards so like if you're in a battle early and you played all these cards you don't have it for the battle you're in late so it's just like all these little things to consider that nothing like if i'm setting up the game and you're like oh yeah that makes sense that makes sense that makes sense and then you're just trying to think oh man there's so much that i have to just consider to be competitive in this game. I think one of the coolest parts about Ankh where I think some deep strategy comes 
comes in with awk is when you're triggering events. So I mentioned the actions being simple. Everybody has a shared action uh, board and you're moving this little token across. And when the token reaches a certain threshold, that triggers an event for the entire table. Now, one of the events is combat. The other event is whoever triggered it gets to take control of a monument, which is important for getting money and stuff like that and scoring. But the other event that I really wanted to talk about is called is like camel caravan. I think it's called. It's just placing camels out on the map. And what camels do is it divides the regions up. So you have one big region and you get to place camels and you can divide it into two. And then you get to flip the order of how the regions fight. And I think that's one of the things that I'm think where I usually explain like you will do this and you won't know why this matters. And then you get into a combat and you're like, oh, I really wish I would have put those camels elsewhere. I really wish I would have kept somebody else out. I really wish I would have split somebody off from this region. And you know what? Eric Lang in general, I think Eric Lang games get kind of lumped in with these like big complex troops on a map games. There's so much going on. And really this trilogy is not like, I think Blood Rage is pretty easy to teach. I think Rising Sun is probably the toughest to teach, but between the, th the three of them, you're actually getting like a pretty easy rule set that you can teach to almost anyone and get going and have a really strategic game and also be done in about two hours. I think Eric Lang is closer to Reiner Knizia's designs than what people think. He's just genius, genius level design. I think it shows in Ankh. I know people have problems with the merge. I personally do not. I think the merge is great because guess what? If you're in last in any of these games, you were still going to finish in last. So don't be sad that we took away your toys. He gave you a catch up mechanism with the merge. He's letting you back in the game. You were never in the game without the merge if you were in last. I really don't have a problem with the merge. I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek with this. I understand why people don't like it, but it's so different I, and I love it. Game five. I'm actually kind of glad I left this one for last. This might be the granddaddy of them all. This might be the number one game of very easy to learn, very hard to do well in or understand like the strategy that's involved and what you're what you're doing. This is going to be Hansa Teutonica, another game I got to play with Jeff and my buddy Kevin was able to come over and we were able to play this game together. Hansa Teutonica, a, a looker of a game, right? Um, those browns, oh my goodness, in the fall, it's lovely. Hansa Teutonica is a classic and I'm so glad the big box got released so everybody can enjoy it. I actually never played until the big box, super cheap game too. But in this, uh, you have five actions. The actions are very easy. They're all listed on your player board. What you can do down here, the iconography, I don't know if it's good, but it's not bad. The actions you can do is get cubes, place cubes on the map, displace somebody else's cubes, move your cubes, or score your cubes, essentially. Uh, I said cubes a lot there too, but this is all about board positioning. Maybe this is a theme. Maybe this is a theme for uh, games that I think that are easy to learn, but hard to do well in. It's all about board positioning and knowing when to strike. So everybody starts off with two actions and you're just putting cubes on the board and you're putting these little discs on the board and you're just trying to decide okay because once you fill up a, a route you can then use an action to claim that route and when you claim a route you can then choose do you want to put your cube off into the city that that route's connected to or do you possibly want to get a bonus and the bonuses could be like more actions uh it could get you more cubes when you take the action that action it could be being able to move more cubes when you take that action so it's like upgrading your board it's making your your player powers better your board better state better or do you claim a city and then the next time somebody claims a route to that city you start scoring so do you put your cube into a city now because everybody wants to go there everybody wants to take claim in that route because they want to get the upgrades and then you can start scoring i like to take claim in the one that lets you get more actions because if you just have two actions the whole game you're not going to do well so i like to take claim in that city first like because people want to go there and i start scoring points but there's been so many times where i've raced to the, up the point track but i did not do well enough on the map that at the end game scoring like i just got lapped it was like i had 18 points at when we ended the game and i ended with like 23 and like somebody whoever won ended at 50 it's just it's so fun of like when do you determine when to make that switch over and there's more to it don't get me wrong there's more to that game really all about placing cubes claiming cities where are you claiming cities because that's going to end game score you got if you have a nice little network hansa Teutonica is just such a, a classic hero i think i think that's one thing like classic heroes hansa Teutonica, tigers and euphrates does really really well is that they kept things so simple and they kept things high interaction i think that's another thing that makes games hard to play really deep strategically is if it's highly interactive multiplayer solitaire i don't think gives that same 
same crunch. Maybe it gives it in a different way because like I really like stuff like Terraforming Mars and I like Wingspan, but it doesn't give me that same angst, that same anxiety that some of these games do because of the players around the table. And I think there's beauty in that design where you know you're going to play this game, you know the rules, and it's like, okay, I can play right from the rip and all my friends are on the same level as me. Who can outsmart the other one? I, I like the big grandiose games. I like TI4. I like Barrage, obviously, but I, I could gush about these games that are just like very easy rule sets and you can teach it in 20 minutes or less. You can get to the table. Everybody's the same level and it's just like, okay, let's let's go. And I think that's one thing that like, that was like what Jeff and I were talking about a lot the weekend he was here. The beauty in that design, because I almost think it's harder to design stuff like that than it is to design the Vitella Serta games where it's just like mechanism within a mechanism within a mechanism within a mechanism. There is like a ton of genius that goes into that too, but it's just not as cool as this because I think if you play something like Vitella Serta is like on Mars, the first 17 times you're playing it, you're just curious if you're making legal moves. You don't have to worry about with these games. These games, like you know what you're doing right off the bat for the most part in terms of like making legal moves and stuff. That's the list. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe. Please like the video. Please comment below. Please join us on the Discord. That's a lot of pleases. I don't, don't make me beg. All right. If you're interested in buying games that are easy to learn and hard to master, may I first suggest your friendly local game store for me here in Columbus. That is the guard tower on Treeview. If you're ever up in Halifax, I would check out the boardroom game cafe on Barrington. That's all I got for you guys and gals. Uh, stay sweet rules because i have a lot to say about it other than what i just said i'm sure i went on too long about it already but uh kind of hard to play uh on your first playthrough at least i've played through three times and i'm still like oh my god i don't know what to do the actions like oh my god i've on a record on a repeat just played over